Welcome to all of you. Thank you for taking the time to be with us. I hope we have an interactive discussion on this particular topic. Uh, I just want to provide some very broad context. It's largely that, you know, first we are living in challenging times uh, uh, where currently worldwide we are seeing a slowdown in growth. We are seeing a slowdown in distribution of that growth uh, for the benefit of all. And at the same time, we are facing a very uh, peculiar situation where most governments are constrained in delivering on the promise of establishing the basic conditions for growth. By that, I mean health, education, skills, jobs, technology. And in part, it's a combination for uh, because of insufficient funds, insufficient capacity, limited ability, and often limited willingness because of the political economy to address some of these basic challenges uh, of uh, public goods and services, which are at the core or at the foundation of growth. <clears throat> I think the good news is that notwithstanding these constraints, both public sector and the private sector want to contribute and are seeking solutions. So what I want to do in this seminar is talk about one such solution, which is the social enterprise. This is an organizational entity which uh, has emerged over the last 15 to 20 years. It has uh, a very interesting and unique combination of organizational characteristics, behavioral characteristics, and business characteristics. It seems to be combining the best of both private and the public sector. So that's sort of the broad context of how do we use social enterprises to address the basic challenges of growth with equity. Uh, this particular presentation, I want to discuss and get your suggestions and inputs on a very basic question. How do we use social enterprises to help both the public and the private sector growth engines to achieve the basic goal of development, which is, as the title suggests, producing growth with equity? Uh, during my presentation, I will be exploring and posing some of the following issues. Why are social enterprises important? In which sectors are they most effective? What are the urgent growth needs and what can be done to help them grow? How do we catalyze and motivate private and public financing to support the growth of social enterprises? And, a very, and lastly, a very big question for discussion. Are there contradictions between the missions of social entrepreneurs and the needs of funders and the perspectives of the funders. That essentially is a very important issue which I hope we could uh, discuss. Then part of my presentation is about how inside the World Bank Group, the development marketplace is attempting to address the needs of social entrepreneurs. I see this session as a brainstorming session where I'm hoping to get your collective wisdom and experience and use these to construct interventions that we collectively can implement in uh, our, in large parts of the world, but in particular in East Africa, South Asia, and Middle East, where the promise of social entrepreneurship seems to be the highest. Uh, let me start by uh, sort of providing a motivating context by giving an example of a very good social enterprise called Vision Spring. This is an enterprise which is dedicated to providing affordable eyeglasses to mitigate vision impair impairment and the consequent economic disadvantages which arise from not being able to see properly. This is from their website, and this is essentially showing the four elements of Vision Spring. They have a product which is affordable. That affordability has been brought about through innovations in the way they procure that product, in the way they distribute that product. They have a delivery model whereby they use communities and uh, folks from within those communities to distribute these products. It does two things. It provides jobs directly to the folks who are involved in the distribution process. And secondly, it enhances acceptability of that product. 
and it has a very powerful impact. Now, this Vision Spring is an entity which grew on the basis of support from a lot of people like you, from foundations, from other institutions. It has a tested business model, it has a tried business model, and yet it is still struggling and finding it difficult to get money to expand its operations. It's currently operating in India, it has operations in Bangladesh, and it has operations in El Salvador. It has tested the model, it has refined the model, and it is applicable in large parts of the country, uh, of the world. Just by way of example, if you look at the impact of Vision Spring, there's been a 35 increase in productivity. Vision Spring has been very systematic in undertaking an impact assessment to demonstrate the power of its business model. It has shown that there's been increase in productivity, there's been an increase in earning, and has also been able to leverage donor dollars. Notwithstanding all this, Vision Spring still finds a challenge in attracting what I would term as quasi-commercial finance. Uh, and I, want to, I wanted to give this example to really show some of the challenges which social entrepreneurs such as Vision Spring face. It's been started by a very dynamic entrepreneur called Jordan Kasselow, a physician who knows the benefits of providing uh, uh, eyeglasses and yet and is trying to do something about it but at every stage feels frustrated. I really recommend you visit their website to get an understanding. I wanted to use this example to show how even in a social enterprise where elements of pragmatism, uh, business organization, uh, a passion for serving the poor are brought in and yet uh, the difficulty in taking it to scale rapidly and that raises a set of questions. Another example which I have not put up, which I do want to discuss, is a very different approach as exemplified by a social enterprise in India called Jaipur Foot. Jaipur Foot has been in existence for about 30 years. Its mission is to provide artificial limbs to folks uh, who do not have uh, limbs. And its business model is very interesting. It does not charge anyone unlike Vision Spring, which charges about $4 per eyeglasses, Jaipur Foot provides these prosthetics free of cost. And yet it has managed to grow. Today it services about 40,000 amputees a year. Its model is based on simply to, uh, inspiring folks with the power and the benefit of what they're doing to contribute. Now that's a very interesting model where in contrast to Vision Spring, there is no price charged. Uh, but what is central to that model is a passion, a commitment, and an integrity which is conveyed through their operations, so their commitment to combine technology, work with institutions such as Stanford and MIT in ceaselessly lowering the cost of delivery or the cost of the product. The other example which they bring to the table is their commitment to keeping their overhead costs lower. When I was talking to Mr. Mehta, the founder of uh, Jaipur Food, he made a very interesting comment. He says he does not even serve one cup of tea to people who visit him or to his staff because a couple of cups of tea is equivalent to the cost of a limb. He'd rather use that money to serve them. So this is, I just wanted to set this stage by giving these two examples in a sense to motivate our conversations. The prosthetic company's name is, I think some of you are asking this question, is Jaipur Foot. It is located in Jaipur in Rajasthan in India. And uh, they have a wonderful website and we will be posting a video about Jaipur Foot after the seminar which sort of walks you through uh, the work they do and how they do it. Uh, in particular, there is a very in inspiring example of an amputee who got an artificial limb and then went on to become a very well-known uh, classical dancer. Uh, that's the kind of uh, examples which you will find on that website. Let me move on forward to what I think is the core of my proposition here. Why are we focusing on social enterprises? And I think there are three reasons which I sort of want to put in front of you, uh, which is essentially that we focus on social enterprises because they combine three important characteristics which neither the 
pure public sector nor the private sector combined. The first of this is a very unique characteristic of social conscience and ethics. That's what distinguishes perhaps a social enterprise from a public sector entity or a private sector entity. They're committed to helping the poor. They have an ethical basis of doing business. And it is that motivation which at the end of the day provides the rationale and the basis for the existence of a social enterprise. And in our work, we are always looking for that particular element. Does the entrepreneur, do the staff of that enterprise display in their day-to-day -day work, in the articulation of their agenda, in the way they implement their work, this essential requirement? The second, I think, characteristic is that social enterprises focus on delivery of public goods. Why is that important? Why is that a distinguishing feature? It's largely because governments often, for a variety of reasons, resources, political economy reasons, often are unable to deliver public goods and services. Uh, and in particular to the bottom two deciles of a country's income distribution, the vulnerable, the marginal, and the minority communities in their society. Often s these groups lose out because the political economy of public investment often is such that resources are captured and preempted by the more organized political interests. So the social enterprises, through their work, in a sense, provide voice uh, to the poor and provide, uh, at the same time, a representation and an organization to the poor. Then the other characteristic which distinguishes them is that at the same time, a social enterprise behaves like a business. In other words, it's in the business of doing things well, doing th uh, delivering goods and services at the lowest possible cost, is constantly searching for ways to lower the price point and make goods and services more affordable to the poor. It's these three unique characteristics, a combination of the public and private sector, which sort of makes us think that the social enterprise sector needs to be supported aggressively and rapidly because they are a way of achieving what I've termed as simultaneously enhancing technical and allocative efficiency. Technical efficiency because they behave like private enterprise. They're cost conscious, they're resource conscious, they, they uh, operate in an organized and a disciplined way. They enhance allocative efficiency because of their focus on the poor, the marginal, and vulnerable. And at the end of the day, development is all about growth with equity. And it's that this two simultaneous combination which results in uh, really uh, social enterprises playing a very powerful role in the process of economic development in any country, anywhere in the world, irrespective of the income level of that country. The challenge I think we face today is social enterprises need money to expand. And in order to expand effectively and in a business-like manner, they need advice on how to use that money to achieve the goals which they've set for themselves. And they need money to do two, two things, essentially. Either replicate or uh, what they're doing in other locations, in other communities, in other countries, or they need to expand so that they can cover both. So, so this is the core rationale. The question I have for you is, have we covered uh, the characteristics of social enterprises uh, as effectively as possible? Or do you think there are other elements of a social enterprise which distinguishes them from any other form of organization? And I also want to pose a very provocative proposition uh, at this stage. Just as the invention of the limited liability company was one of the most powerful organizational innovations 200 years ago, which unlocked large pools of capital, permitted greater risk taking, I would submit social enterprise as a legal construct, as an organizational entity, is now an equally powerful organizational innovation because it brings together the state, the private sector, into a new form of a legal structure with a clearly defined mission. Uh, I, I, I'd really like to get your views on uh, whether are we seeing this innovation 
uh, as being permanent, as being the way growth will happen in the 21st century. Let me move to what I see are the three essential elements and elaborate on those of what constitutes a social enterprise. Uh, and these are three circles. Scalability, I think, is very important uh, of a so good social enterprise. Often you start out by helping 100 people, 200 people, maybe helping five villages. At the end of the day, in order to have a systemic development impact, to be considered as an equal partner of the public and private sector, it has to be scaled up. And therefore, I think in any social enterprise, the element of scalability is crucial. The next element is commercial viability. Now, this is typically what we expect of small and medium enterprises, which are selling goods and services for a profit. Now, here is where I want to pause and perhaps have a discussion in the next slide as to what do we mean by commercial viability in the context of social enterprise. But the point I want to make is, if you want to grow, if you want to attract capital, you have to be financially sustainable. You have to know where your money is coming from. You have to know how the money is being used. You have to be assured that two years from now, the way you want to expand, you have funds available. So that's the second important element of a social enterprise, a commercially viable or a financially viable component. The third element of a social enterprise, obviously, is high social impact. That's what distinguishes it from a pure private enterprise, that it is focused on helping the poor. It is f that the mission, core mission of a social enterprise is to help the poor. And therefore, we need to be able to document, or the social enterprise needs to be able to demonstrate that it is achieving that mission. Moving on to the next slide, I've sort of uh, combined these and elaborated on some of the concepts of scalability. In a business sense, the way business thinks about scale is you have declining unit costs as you expand production. In other words, there's a downward uh, cost curve. That's essentially how businesses think of, and that's how I think we need to think of when we talk about scalability in this space. I have, if you will notice, shifted the emphasis from commercial viability to financial viability, and I've defined different levels of financial viability. You could cover your operating costs without making a profit. You could be break-even on, uh, on a cash flow basis. You could have full cost break-even, or you could even give a rate of return. These are different levels of financial viability. And the question where I think we need to ponder over is, what do we mean by financial viability in the context of uh, social entrepreneurship? Is it the same as commercial viability? Should it be the same if you have to attract equity investors, if you have to attract money from debt and capital markets. The, uh, the other point which I want to make is where all these three things intersect, where an enterprise is scalable, where an enterprise is financially viable, and where the enterprise has high social impact, the sweet spot, everyone wants to be in that space. In a sense, I would argue that's the easiest thing to do. It's easy. Everything is already taken care of. But I think as development practitioners, our challenge is somewhere else. It's in the space which I've defined as challenge space, where you want to really focus on enterprises which are scalable, but which also focus on very high social impact. And I would posit this is the space which we really need to think about in the next two, three years. The question there, the operational question is, how do we work with enterprises which are in this space and over a period of time slowly move them to the sweet spot such that the normal and traditional pools of capital are then unlocked. That's the essential uh, question which I want to pose with regard to the question of financial viability and the challenge we face. Building on this, this is where we need to add value. And in this space, what does value, adding value means? We need to be thinking in terms of investing in areas where others can't and won't, and I mean others, largely the traditional financiers. Uh, we need to think in terms of how do we catalyze new funders to be willing and ready to invest in enterprises which are in this particular uh, spot. Often these are enterprises who are first movers, who are slowly thinking in terms of applying technology, new business models, uh, experimenting with uh, ideas in order to go to scale. They need patient capital. They need 
capital which is willing to give them the time and the space to conduct experiments, to learn from these experiments. And, uh, and typically these experiments will take four to five years. Imagine in a normal situation of a commercial startup, Typically, an enterprise stays in this space for two to three years and then moves on. Either it fails or it moves on. Our observations are, uh, empirical data suggests that as far as social enterprises are concerned, in this space they stay for at least four to five years before they either fail or they really go to scale. In other words, the time at this stage is about twice that of a commercial enterprise and therefore it automatically suggests the need for more patient capital. Now our proposition is that patient capital has to come through a combination of official and private funders. Official because they're interested in delivering public goods, private funders because they're interested in ensuring that their financing also has broad social benefits. And that's the question which I think we should be thinking about. How do we attract more patient capital into this particular space? Now, the next slide is really about my proposition here and our proposition in the World Bank that the focus has to be not so much right now in the next two, two three years on encouraging new ideas as much as on encouraging existing social enterprises expand. And this is where I really want to focus our attention on, on the three concepts which I have proposed in this slide, an operational uh, social enterprise. We would like to support, and I would argue that we need to prioritize in supporting those social enterprises which have been in existence for at least two years and have, are using some sort of a defined business model. Uh, the second thing I would argue is necessary in terms of priority is to focus on enterprises which can show or document evidence for going to scale. And again, I'm using a technical term here, a downward sloping marginal cost curve. In other words, we want to focus on enterprises where we see the potential for lowering of the costs of goods and services so that folks who have, who are defined as being below the poverty line, two dollars or less per, of income per day are able to afford it. Because if you can really by scale lower the costs, you're increasing demand and you're increasing the viability of that demand. The last point which I want to make is we want to focus on financial viability. We want to be able to see enterprises which can demonstrate that they have ways of securing a predictable or a growing cash flow stream. By that I don't mean profits. What I mean is they're able to show that they are, can tie up and organize funding to enable them to expand their operations for next five to seven years. Uh, my submission is for the next three years it would be great if we could focus on such uh, entities. Going to the next slide I've tried to present on how we think in terms of who we should be targeting. This is a way of essentially showing the financial social axis. Uh, what we ideally want is to move from a solely profit maximizing and an investment concept to a concept where there is a minimum financial floor as well as there's a minimum impact flow which is this quadrant and this is where we want to attract funding in this quadrant and the two types of funders here. Funders who are likely to look for financial impact first and funders who are likely to look for social impact first. Our hypothesis is that at this stage we want to focus on impact first investors because they are committed to uh, sort of ensuring that the benefits to the poor are at the core of an enterprise operations. If we can convince them to fund them and if we can use their know-how and their capital to help the enterprise uh, develop a good model, then our hypothesis is over a period of time the financial first investors would get also get interested. Uh, this is just a snapshot of the various entities which are in the social investing ecosystem at different stages of uh, the 
of the financial life cycle or the financial conveyor belt. This is not a complete list. It's not meant to be a complete list. It's to give you a sense of some of the important players who are already there. To me, the striking thing about this slide, and when I was preparing this, I was looking at different foundations, uh, different uh, investment funds, uh, equity investors. What struck me most was the absence of funders and the absence of government from developing countries. And I want to pose this question. Why is it that we don't have funders, foundations, charities formally represented in this ecosystem? Our hypothesis is this is where there is a major gap which needs to be filled. And the question is, why do we need to fill this? When I look at a number of social enterprises, say particularly in India and in East Africa, I often find that the early stages of support came from local charities, from local individuals wanting to support this purely on the basis of a good cause. In other words, they gave money uh, for, on the basis of what their heart said. Uh, but that's, that's, that's limited. I want to ask the question, can we take the same set of local funders and bring them into this ecosystem where they combine their heart with a certain degree of hard-headedness about how a business is run? But that, to me, is the real challenge as we go forward. How do we expand the community of supporters by bringing in uh, local foundations, local charities, and most importantly, governments who allocate large sums of monies for their social welfare department, for the education department, for the health department. And this is, again, a summary slide of what, I, what are the critical issues uh, in helping social entrepreneurs go to scale. I want to, uh, and if you go through each block, I think the central issue, which, as we see it, a few ventures are financially stable to achieve systemic impact and scale. And they're financially not stable, and because of that, they're not able to access growth capital, because providers of growth capital want to see some degree and some assurance of financial stability. Uh, and, you know, they're looking for deals which are financially stable. Governments are looking to root funds through social enterprises. The challenges, I think, are we need to increase the pipeline of operational SEs, financially viable uh, social enterprises, who, are, who already are using some kind of a business model. And the questions which really arise to me, and I want to pose a set of issues over here is that what we need is a capital plus approach. If we want to access capital, we need to be able to help social entrepreneurs demonstrate that they can use the capital well, which means we need to be able to work with social entrepreneurs in perfecting the non-financial elements of running an enterprise, the organizational characteristics, the technology requirements, the pricing model, the supply chain model. These are some of the things which often are missing uh, from social entrepreneurship. So our hypothesis, therefore, is we need to be operating on two fronts, working with impact investors, presenting them with the pipeline of deals. At the same time, this pipeline is assisted in perfecting the non-financial dimensions of running an enterprise. How should an organization be structured? What, what technology should it evolve? What should be its marketing strategy? What should be its communication strategy? What should be its community outreach strategy? How does it assemble, source, in-house or externally the right bundle of skills necessary to run a well-managed institution, where do they get this uh, uh, set of skills? Therefore, this is what I think is the next set of challenges which we need to focus on. Uh, related to that, and let me go back and uh, make a, another important point, which is, you know, all of us are social enterprises to go to scale. But I think as supporters and funders of social enterprises, we also need to ask a question of ourselves. How do we provide support on scale? Currently, the model is one-on-one -on -one, uh, conversations between a social enterprise and a funder, which is expensive, time-consuming, high overheads. So can we 
what are the platforms, what are the methods for achieving low cost intermediation, how do we lower overhead costs of administering support to these entities. I think it's a central question. Related to that, therefore, is how do we create these structures locally? Why is it important to create these structures locally and embed them in the economies of the countries? It is because if we do that, then the understanding of the political economy context, the social context of the needs of the poor are better understood. The second thing is by embedding them in the local context, we are then able to mobilize and form alliances with powerful elites who know how to work the system, who know how to overcome regulatory barriers, who know how to overcome legal barriers. So the thoughts which I want to leave behind with you is, can we construct a system of mentorship which brings in the best from all over the world, which combines it with local experience and understanding, and bring these two types of mentors together to help a social enterprise think through its problems? So that's the, that's the important point which I want to make uh, over here. Then going to the financial conveyor belt, I just want to, this is, I want to set the context for what we do in the development marketplace and where we are going. Currently, Till recently, till about a year ago, the development marketplace was focused on encouraging the growth of ideas in this particular space. And the reason was fairly simple. The space was still emerging. Our goal was to publicize and make development practitioners aware of the importance and the relevance of social entrepreneurship. So our effort was to publicize ideas emerging from passionate young social activists, from uh, business students inclined towards uh, helping the poor. I think we've achieved that. There are a large number of organizations, much bigger than even the development marketplace, who are supporting this idea. Where we think there is a gap is in the middle, in providing that patient capital, in working with existing social entrepreneurs, perfect a business model, so then they can get the early stage of growth financing. This is where we posit the financial conveyor belt comes to a grinding halt. And this is the principal bottleneck in this particular ecosystem, that there are not too many players who are willing and interested in providing that patient capital. Our hypothesis is this is where development marketplace can play a catalytic role in bringing together impact investors, foundations, uh, charity organizations, governments, to fund social enterprises overcome this particular growth point. This is our objective. And, and we combine this objective to say it's to mobilize capital plus capacity. So we need to work with TA providers. We need to work with local philanthropies. We need to work with foundations. We need to work with wealthy diaspora. If we work with these entities first and foremost, combine it with uh, purposive, customized capacity building support done at scale, then our hypothesis is we would be able to unlock monies from traditional providers like the pension funds, etc. So this is, this is the second uh, issue which I want to raise. In that context, I also want to draw your attention back to the three questions which I had posed, which as of so far arise as I go through my presentation. Can we combine the social objectives and of uh, development with the commercial and the financial viability consideration of the funders? Are they compatible? Are they inherently conflicting? Or is there uh, in-between space at which both of can exist? That's the first question. You know, it's heartening to note that most of you think uh, that it is a financial profitability is a necessary condition for scaling up social uh, impact and expanding services. Let me ask, let me be a little bit provocative. By financial, pr would we be willing to sacrifice the benefits to the poor in order to achieve financial profitability? Uh, if I am pursuing financial prof profitability, what is the risk that I will target my service delivery not to the poor, but to the folks who can already afford to pay f at least if not in full, in part for those services? Am I running a risk that my beneficiaries of the services which I provide will land up to be no more than the lower middle class? 
and I'm deliberately posing this question in a pretty stark manner, related to that question is, to ha achieve financial profitability, uh, at the same time really reach the poor, we have to have a price point which is extremely low. In other words, you have to make your goods and services affordable. In order to make those goods and services affordable at a price, uh, acceptable to the poorest of the poor, what needs to be done? Should we be also thinking in terms of perhaps get, get, having the government give a subsidy, have the government uh, for uh, delivery of goods and services, link it to some performance? Should we be thinking in terms of unbundling capital expenditure and working capital and asking for uh, subsidizing capital expenditures but insisting on operational financial viability? These are a range of questions which arise, which if we could discuss later on, it would be great. So could we move on to the next uh, question? I see it on my screen is, it's very heartening to note that majority of you say uh, a social conscience and commitment to the poor is compatible with running a social enterprise on business and management principles. Uh, I think most folks would agree with this proposition, yet I would also like to point out that there are examples of very large uh, social enterprises in developing economies who actually contest this proposition, who say that as long as I am committed to servicing the poor, solutions will emerge. I don't need to really think about uh, systematically or forming a company. The dilemmas they raise is that the moment I form a company, uh, I lose voluntarism, I lose passion, and the folks working in that company just become like any other employee in any other company. And therefore, the incentives change. I become much more focused on either answering to my funders or answering to my employees. So the third challenge they raise is that the moment you create an organized structure, then you run the risk of losing the poor who think that you're like any other business that you're out there to exploit them. These are some of the observations which I'm sort of reporting from large nonprofit organizations who are run as NGOs who object to the concept of social entrepreneurship. I think our challenge really is to convince them that they can continue to be social activists, they can continue to adhere to their principles of commitments to social delivery without losing uh, without, uh, at the same time, being more businesslike. And this is where I think capacity building, uh, technical assistance support, uh, problem solving services to such organizations is extraordinarily critical because these are the folks who have the reach, who have the credibility, and who have the commitment. Uh, and it would be great for us to think in terms of how we achieve uh, credibility and communication with such enterprises. So that's my sort of broad response, but it is sort of consistent with the way most of us think about this particular space. Uh, question three is a question which I raised because often, at least in many of the developing economies, we've found that women make better social entrepreneurs simply because, for two reasons they know where the rubber hits the road. They have to deal with these problems on a day-to-day -day basis. They're constantly uh, trying to uh, do more with less. They're sort of, our observation has been they're more goal-driven, more results-driven, they want a solution. Now, some folks have argued that women are not risk-takers as much as uh, others are or men are. Uh, and that's a question which I want to pose to you. Is risk-taking an essential characteristic of a social enterprise or is going to scale the principal characteristic? In other words, risk-taking per se should be the goal or should, be the, or should the goal be how do you expand the scope of services and how do you make them affordable and how do you make sure that they reach the poor? But uh, it's just an observation because often we found that the most effective social enterprises were those which had a large complement of women and, the, and simply because social enterprises deliver those services which women are most concerned about, 
health, education, immunization, uh, basic nutrition uh, needs of a family. So should we be thinking in terms of having a special focus on helping such women entrepreneurs uh, go to scale more rapidly? That was the purpose of this question. Uh, the responses seem to suggest a fairly equal division, the suggesting that there is nothing uh, inherently wrong in uh, focusing on women as uh, social entrepreneurs. So I leave it at that. This is just to get some insights from the community. So let me quickly uh, finish off the remaining portion of the presentation, which focuses on what we are trying to do in the development marketplace. So this is the slide, which is where I want to talk about what our DM focus is. We are going to focus on this middle portion. And our focus is going to be on entrepreneurs which are at early takeoff stage. By that, I mean social enterprises which have a tested working prototype or a business model which is ready for scaling. Our hypothesis is this is the major hump and transition point in a firm's life cycle. Most firms fail or succeed at this particular stage of growth. And if we can help a greater number of firms cross over that hump, we are better off. And we think this is where and actually there is not enough capital available. Once you've gone over this hump, a lot of the traditional investors, uh, venture capitalists, uh, social investment funds are willing to look at you. But they're not willing to look at you if, you have, if you're still struggling to get over this hump. So our feeling is that since we are funded by public monies, this is the best use of our public money is to do a public service which then enables other to take advantage of our investments in this particular uh, spot. This is a broad summary of our new strategy. Uh, instead of direct funding of grantees, we want to go towards linking a pipeline to impact investors. We want to work with other institutions which have a pipeline. We want to collaborate with seeing how we can collectively present this pipeline to impact investors. The second essential point which I touched upon was that typically we've been running this out of Washington. And the consequence of that is our overhead costs are very high. Our procedures become complicated because we work in a large organization and we are therefore the cost of administration often is as much as the cost of an individual grant. So our goal is to go local. We are very interested in working with local partners in identifying local partners who can do bulk of the function. So our support in future would shift to working with local intermediaries. The challenge we face is how do we identify such intermediaries? How, what kind of partnerships do we need to construct with these local intermediaries? What support do we provide to local intermediaries as they step up their intermediation function of originating a pipeline, evaluating that pipeline, identifying their funding need, identifying their technical assistance need, and organizing a package for development? The third thing which we want to do is we want to shift away from one-off competitions to taking a programmatic approach. And we've already done that. For example, we will no longer hold topic-wise competitions once a year out of Washington. Our approach is, given limited bandwidth, is to focus on a few regions and go deep, create a calendar of predictable activities around the development marketplace. For these reasons, for the next three years, we'll be focusing on East Africa, South Asia, and Middle East, where our intention is to be present locally, supporting local institutions for the next three to five years, using our money to leverage monies from others, systematically building a continuous pipeline which can be presented to funders. Uh, the other important shift which we are making is instead of managing grants, from within the World Bank and within the development marketplace, and I want to be honest over here, we are an expensive institution. Uh, our cost of management are extraordinarily high, and our procedures, because we are a public institution, and by law are required to be very transparent in the way we conduct business, often we are slow. So we, are, we now have the capacity to take our monies and park it into such third parties, such as Ashoka, where, and who have an excellent program and say, you're already running an excellent program, you already have an existing infrastructure, here are two, three issues which we'd like to be addressed 
in Kenya or in India or in Bangladesh? Can we work with you? Can we use your infrastructure? So this is a major departure from the way we're going to be doing business. The four criteria which we're going to be using to really uh, think in terms of our future program. For us, as I said, social impact is very critical. We really, this is our principal focus. And if you were to talk in terms of relative weighting between these criteria, we typically give 40% weight to social impact. We give about 20% weight to sustainability. We give about 25% weight to growth potential. And we give about 10 to 15% weight to innovation. Now, people will ask, why are you giving such low weight to innovation? It's not because we don't think innovation is important, but the way we think of innovation is innovation with a purpose, innovation with the intention of scaling up, with the intention of enhancing social impact, which is why for us, the other three, uh, the first three variables are particularly important. And social impact is obviously of the greatest importance because the World Bank's mission is about poverty eradication. It is about making sure that directly or indirectly, the benefits of World Bank operations flow to the poor. That's in our charter. We are funded by governments on the promise that the World Bank will help the poor. So and therefore, consistent with the overall corporate objective of the World Bank, we have to place emphasis much more on social impact than any other variable. And also, by doing so, it permits our capacity to leverage government monies, because that's what the government is interested in working with us. Now, quickly going through our specific programs, this is a quick uh, summary of what we are doing in India. Uh, we, this is in India. We've started implementing the first stages of a new strategy. We have two very good partners. We are collaborating with uh, IFC, and we're collaborating with a local partner. And here we're using a combination of development marketplace competitions in low-income states with uh, a pipeline from other partners to systematically help operational social enterprises go to scale and connect them to providers of finance. In East Africa, we are taking a slightly different approach where we are working very purposefully with impact investors already present there and early stage investment funds to look at their pipeline and see how their pipeline, which is finance ready, but not fully finance ready, but which, but which if some capacity building is provided, could become finance ready in six months to one year time. That's the model which we're using in East Africa. In Middle East, we are still at a very early stage. We try to think in terms of how do we support the emergence of a robust local ecosystem with a principal focus on livelihood and income mobility services. So as you can see, we have a variety of different models which we're experimenting with. We also have an investment platform where we've taken old uh, previous development marketplace winners, use four MBA students from Oxford to help them prepare funding proposals, which we are now going to be presenting to impact investors and social investment funds for uh, potential financing. We are also entering into capacity building alliances. We are likely to enter into a collaboration with GSBI. GSBI runs a very highly successful face-to-face uh, -face training programs. We're going to be working with them to see how that face-to-face -face program could be made online and simultaneously reach 300 to 400 uh, social entrepreneurs uh, all over the world without the need or the cost of coming to Santa Clara. And our goal, our role would be is to principally provide that pipeline and also provide the local context. Uh, we're also, I would mention, in discussion with Showbank International to collaborate with them to think in terms of the question which I had posed to you, how do we work with local intermediaries, what are the successful elements of a collaboration with local intermediation. Uh, let me end over here. I just want to quickly, you can look at the slides on what we've done in the India Development Marketplace, which was held in Jaipur, which we are going to be replicating again this year. We're going to run two development marketplaces in India. And our expectation is we will generate at least uh, potential pipeline of at least 300 to 400 social enterprises who are operational, who are already doing business in India in the poorest seven uh, uh, 
uh, states of India and who are ready to go to scale. That's our program and this is the process which I've described. Thank you very much. I had to rush through with the last part, but I just wanted to get this on the table. Thank you. Mm -hmm.